Hey folks, in this video I want to show you how you can add role-based authorization to your .NET API. Role-based authorization basically just means that you're going to restrict access to a controller or a specific endpoint in your API based on whether or not that user has specific roles. I have a demo controller set up here and right now I have it set up so that the whole controller is authenticated. It has this authorized tag on it. That authorized tag just means that you have to be an authenticated user in order to call any API endpoint in this controller. So that means on this base git right here, you just have to be authenticated. But on this route down here that is slash admin, I have it set up so that only users who have the role of admin can see this endpoint. And then similar for this endpoint down here of slash user, only people who have the user role can use this endpoint. The way that I'm gonna show how to hook this up in this demo is assuming that you are managing the roles of users in your application somehow. You might be mapping a user's email address or a user's ID to the roles that they have. For this demo, I'm not hooked up to an actual database, but I do have a little fake database call here. So I'm going to get the roles for a specific email address. And then I have a dictionary that's going to map the email address to the roles for that user. And mapping roles to a specific user is something you might have to do if you are using a third-party provider for authentication. For example, you might be using Okta or Auth0 or Active Directory or something like that. So let's jump in and see how we actually get this added. I'm in the program file of my API, and in one of my previous videos, I went over how to add basic authentication to an API. So that's what I'm going to use for this demo. You might not be using basic authentication. You might be using, like I said, a third-party provider, which would be passing you, for example, a bearer token, um, a JWT token. And the important thing is whatever you're using for authentication is creating a claims principle. So if I go into my basic authentication handler here, most of this isn't important, at least for this demo here. But what is important is that once I show that this person is authenticated, which I'm just doing it in memory here, don't actually do this in production, if they are authenticated, I am adding a new claim called name identifier, and then I'm setting the value of that claim to the username, which in this case is going to be an email address, which I'm hard coding to test at fake.com. And then down here, I'm creating a claims identity and I'm applying that to a claims principle. So like I said, if you're using a third party tool, Okta, Auth0, stuff like that, chances are you have something from a library that they've created that's doing this for you. But the important part is you need to know what the claim is that is the unique identifier of your user. In my case, it's this name identifier claim. Okay, moving on to actually adding these roles. The way we're going to do this is using a claims transformation. This is an interface provided by Microsoft. I'll put a link in the description down below. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to create a claims principle. We're going to add the claim that we need to add, in our case, roles. And then we're going to add it to the principle and then return it. So in my code, I'm going to add a new class and I'm just going to call it claims transformation service. And then I'm just going to have that inherit from claims transformation and I'll go ahead and bring in the using statements for that. And then we need to implement the transform async method for this. So I'm gonna go ahead and just let writer do that for me. So I'll say implement missing members. I am going to make that async. And the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that this user is authenticated. So we're going to check the is authenticated property on the identity. And if it is not true, we're just gonna return the principal and it can continue on its way. Next, since the user is authenticated, we're going to go ahead and grab that name identifier claim from the principal. So find first value is going to give us the value of that claim. And I'm going to assign it to a variable called user ID. I'm calling it user ID because it's the name identifier, um, even though it is an email address. And now I want to use that email address to go get the roles for this user. And in our case, I'm going to use that user service that has um, the fake database call in it. So I need to go ahead and inject that. So I'm going to create a constructor and I will bring in the user service. And then I'll assign that to a private read-only object up here. Now I can use that user service to go get the roles for that specific user. I'm just going to assign that to a variable called roles. And really quickly, I'll just go show how that works. I'm passing in the email address and I'm going to simulate a database call. I'm also adding a small delay to simulate a database call. And then I'm going to either return the list of roles that are found from this try get value method here. And if it finds no roles, I'm just going to return an empty list. So next we wanna see that we got back any roles. If we didn't get back any roles, just go ahead and return and stop doing what we're doing. And next we're going to loop through all of those roles that we got back for the user and we're going to add them to our claims principle. So I'll say for each role in roles, if the principal already has this specific claim, then we're just going to continue because we don't wanna add the same claim twice. And the reason I'm checking that is because in Microsoft's documentation, it does say that this method might get called multiple times, so only add a new claim if it is not already existing in the claims principal. 
And then if we do not have that claim already added, we're going to go ahead and add it with a type of role, which you can see here if I hover over this, this is just a constant and it maps to this string right here. And then we're just gonna add in the role name. And then lastly, we're just going to return the principal. And that's it. So that's all we have to do in this claims transformation service, but we do have to add something into our program to tell the API to actually use this. Back in the program file, after this line where we add the authentication, we're going to go ahead and add in the service for that claims transformation. So we're going to say builder.services add transient, and the interface type is iClaimsTransformation, and then the name of the service that we created. So I'm going to go ahead and import that. Essentially what this does is when a user gets authenticated, it's going to go ahead and call this claims transformation service right after it gets authenticated. So this is all basically middleware, and it's going to get called before your code even starts to execute on the controller. And now let's go verify and make sure this works. So I'll go ahead and I'll run this in my Swagger page. And like always, I forgot to register my user service. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in a scoped variable for my user service. If I had a dollar for every time I did that, I could retire. I swear I do that all the time. All right, let's try this again. Now from our Swagger page, I can run these demo endpoints and see if we get successes from these. So first, I'm just gonna make sure that authentication is actually working correctly. So I'm just gonna say try it out and execute and I get back a 401, which is good. So now I'll say authorize and I'll give it the email address that I've been using and I'll pass in my password. And now I'll try that again and I should get back a 200. So that is working correctly. So that means authentication is still working. And I'll open up the admin endpoint and I'll try that one out. And I got back a 200 from that, which seems like it's good. Let's try the users page and make sure that works. That one also works. But let's put in a couple breakpoints and make sure that these roles are getting added correctly. And then I'll go in and I'll remove my roles and I'll make sure we get back a 403. In my claims transformation service, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add a breakpoint on the line where I go get the user roles. And I will call this one again. And we can see that the user ID is test at fake.com. So that means it's pulling out the name correctly from the name identifier. If I go to the next line, we can see here I'm getting back my two roles, which is great. And I'm going to go ahead and jump down to the very end when I return the principal. And now if I go to the principal and I view this and I go to claims and then results, you can see that now I have three claims on here. The name identifier claim, which is the email address. And then I have the two roles, which are admin and user. That means it's correctly adding the roles to the principal. And to test this for a failure, I'm gonna go into my fake database call here and I'm just going to remove the user role from the user that I've been using. I'll save that and run it. And now I should be able to run this and the admin endpoint should still work and the user one should fail. So if I go back into my Swagger page, it's already authorized. If I execute this, I did get back a 200 from that. So let's go ahead and close this and try the user one. And if I execute this and I get back a 403, which is perfect. That means that our authorization for those roles is working. And just to recap back in the controller, these roles are used to determine whether or not the user can see this endpoint. And in these examples, I'm only using one role for each one of these endpoints. However, you can add multiple roles into here. So for example, you could say if the user has the role of admin or the role of user, they can see this. So when you comma separate these values, that means it's an or statement. And if you want to require that they have multiple roles, then you need to put two different authorized tags in there with the different values. So doing it this way means that the user has to be an admin and a user in order to see this endpoint. And also, of course, if you want to, you can remove any role restrictions, which again, this just means that that person is authenticated. And also, since we have authorized on our controller, I could take this off and it's going to inherit the same permissions as the controller. Or I could also say allow anonymous. And that just means that you don't have to be authenticated or have roles to call this endpoint. And that should be all you need to add custom roles into your authorization process for your .NET APIs. If you have any questions, put them in the comments down below. I'll try to get back to you. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you later.